Did Francis Bacon die in 1626, or did he feign his death with the help of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood? This video is dedicated to Baconians Constance Pott, Parker Woodward and Bertram G. Theobald. As he moved into the final decade of his known life, Francis Bacon anticipated that the running grievance of patents and monopolies were likely to dominate Parliament. In February 1621, the patent for gold and silver thread, whose profits had been divided between the King, the favourite Buckingham, and his brother, Sir Christopher Villiers, was put under investigation, which Bacon as referee became caught up in, opening the door for his enemies, principally led by his old adversary, Sir Edward Coke, to bring malicious allegations against him for corruption. He turned to James I and Buckingham for protection. Instead, the King, to save Buckingham, and the royal favourite, to save himself, sacrificed Bacon in one of the greatest political betrayals in all English history, which has continued to unjustly damage his reputation in the eyes of posterity to the present day. On the 3rd of May 1621, the House of Lords passed its severe sentence. He was dismissed from office as Lord Chancellor and banned from holding any other office of state or serving in Parliament. He was fined the enormous sum of £40,000 and in imprisonment at the King's pleasure and forbidden to come within 12 miles of the verge of the court. He was taken to the Tower on the 31st of May but was released a few days later on the 2nd of June and taken to the house of Sir John Vaughan at Parsons Green in Fulham for some rest and recuperation. In the last five years of his recorded life, Bacon wrote, revised, expanded, translated and published an enormous body of his writings and works in Latin and English. This was carried out in his literary workshop at Gorhambury with the help of his good pens, among them his dear friend, the metaphysical poet George Herbert, who assisted him in translating De Augmentis Scientiarum, and the poet and dramatist Ben Jonson, who assisted Bacon in translating his essays from English into Latin, which had been previously printed and published by John and William Jaggard, who, with his son Isaac Jaggard, printed and published the Shakespeare First Folio. The Shakespeare First Folio, with its Rosicrucian Freemasonry imagery and symbols, is dedicated by Bacon in the name of Hemming and Condell. At the time of the publication of the first folio of the Shakespeare plays, its dedicatee, William Herbert, 3rd Earl of Pembroke, was secretly occupying Solomon's chair in his magnificent capacity as Grand Master of all England. William Earl of Pembroke was chosen Grand Master 1618 and being approved by the King he appointed Inigo Jones his Deputy Grand Master. Grand Master Pembroke demitted AD 1630. In 1624, supported by William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, Grand Master of England, his kinsman, the metaphysical poet George Herbert, was returned MP for Montgomery under the control of the other incomparable brethren, Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. And in the same year, his Rosicrucian master, Bacon, dedicated to him the translation of certain psalms into English verse. To his very good friend, Mr. George Herbert. The pains that it pleased you to take about some of my writings, I cannot forget, which did put me in mind to dedicate to you this poor exercise of my sickness. So, with signification of my love and acknowledgement, I ever rest, your affectionate friend, Francis St. Alban. As Bacon, with the help of Dr. Rawley, Ben Johnson and George Herbert, continued to revise, enlarge and translate his works for publication, he was mindful that a change of monarch was on the horizon, with all its potential implications for the kingdom and for him personally. During the last year of his life, the health of James I was steadily deteriorating and he was rarely able to visit London, 
While the favourite Buckingham, who had sacrificed Bacon and in his distress extorted York House from him, took the opportunity to extend his influence over the heir to the throne, Prince Charles. On the 27th of March 1625, King James died at Theobalds in Hertfordshire, with Buckingham at his bedside. Bishop Williams preached the funeral sermon and James was buried in the Henry VII Chapel in Westminster Abbey on the 5th of May, with the Earl of Mar and Kelly ominously writing, The world now belonged to Charles and Buckingham. Following his succession, there was no return to favour for Bacon or any offer of a position in the new regime or government as Charles I and Buckingham believed they could jointly rule without the need or advice of the kingdom's greatest and wisest statesman. It was a decision of consequence that not only had serious and potentially dangerous implications for Bacon, but it may also have prevented the impeachment and assassination of Buckingham and the eventual deposing and the state execution of Charles I, as well as the bloody English Civil War. In early April 1625, Bacon was officially dismissed from his position on the Privy Council. The development might well have moved Bacon to seriously consider the consequences and potential dangers of life under a new royal regime and the need for contingency, contingency plans if the matter could not be reversed or improved upon. He knew better than anyone and had painful first-hand experience of the behaviour of monarchs towards those they perceived as a threat or had fallen out of favour. His situation was becoming increasingly desperate, with the King and Buckingham all but freezing him out in whose hands his life, future well-being and financial security rested. Bacon had continually appealed to King Charles and Buckingham, directly and indirectly, repeatedly calling upon influential intermediaries to intervene on his behalf, and friends to press his suits and requests for his personal and political rehabilitation. Around the beginning of the year, Bacon wrote to Sir Humphrey May, Chancellor of the Duchy, in anticipation of the meeting of the new Parliament, which confirms that he had not received a full pardon from the King or leave to resume his parliamentary duties, reiterating his request to sound the Duke of Buckingham's good affection towards me before you do move him in the particular petition. Only the present occasion doth invite me to desire that his grace would procure me a pardon of the king of the whole sentence. My writ for Parliament I have now had twice before the time, and that without any express restraint not to use it. It is true that I shall not be able, in respect of my health, to attend Parliament, but yet I more to make a proxy. Time hath turned envy to pity, and I have had a long cleansing week of five years expiation and more. Sir John Bennett hath his pardon. My Lord of Somerset hath his pardon, and, they say, shall sit in Parliament. My Lord of Suffolk cometh to Parliament, though not to Council. I hope I deserve not to be the only outcast. These were the words of a desperate man who had finally run out of patience with the King and Buckingham, who were very deliberately ignoring his plight and requests of which they had no intention of receiving with any grace and compassion. The writing was very much on the wall, and with little or no hope of relief and rehabilitation, the time had arrived for him to face up to some harsh truths and difficult decisions. There is also the possibility, and in light of the evidence and circumstances, the likelihood that Bacon had heard through back channels and highly placed friends that both the King and Buckingham wished him ill, or worse, represented a very real danger to his life. For reasons unbeknown, some time in January 1626, Bacon travelled from Gorhambury up to London, most probably to meet and liaise with some of his friends and members of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, 
to discuss his future plans at a meeting that may have taken place at Canonbury Tower. For the previous decade, Bacon had owned the lease on Canonbury Tower, which still stands well preserved in Islington, North London, and is perhaps the oldest surviving Rosicrucian Freemasonic Lodge in the world, and until recently home to the Francis Bacon Society and the Canonbury Masonic Research Centre. However this may be, on the 26th of January, Bacon wrote a letter from his chambers at Gray's Inn petitioning Secretary Conway. His standard biographer Spedding points out that he was well enough to come up to London, but we have no particular account of his occupations there until the end of March, on his way to Highgate House, the London residence of his close friend the Earl of Arundel. Or, put another way by Jardine and Stuart, the letter to Conway is the only sure information we have of Francis Bacon's activities in early 1626. Less than three months later, he was dead. Or was he? In the meantime, in the spring of 1626, the Earl of Arundel also found himself on the wrong side of the royal displeasure of King Charles and the favourite Buckingham. On the 4th of March, he was arrested on the pretext he had allowed his son, Lord Maltravers, to marry a royal ward, Lady Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of the Duchess of Lennox, preventing royal plans to marry her to Lord Lorn. In reality, this was a convenient charade. King Charles and Buckingham had known about the marriage since at least the 6th of February and had done nothing. The real reason for his imprisonment was Arundel's powerful and influential presence in the House of Lords and his five proxy votes that threatened Buckingham's power base. Following his arrest, the Earl of Arundel was taken to the Tower where he, rem he remained for weeks, preventing him from attending the sessions of the House of Lords and galvanising opposition against Buckingham and through him the vindictive Charles I. The House of Lords were outraged at Arundel's incarceration and effective banishment from taking his place in the House and saw it as an infringement of their privileges. It was the first time a peer had been prevented from attending a session since Edward III had imprisoned the Bishop of Winchester and the House of Lords demanded his immediate release from the Tower. He was freed in the April shortly after Bacon's apparent death at the Earl of Arundel's house at Highgate. In a turn of events that no doubt would not have surprised Bacon, who also possessed an acute sense of poetical justice, the most hated and reviled figure in the kingdom, Buckingham, was now about to face impeachment. The House of Commons had set up a committee to identify the causes of the evils by which the state was afflicted and to propose remedies. The committee decided that Buckingham was the principal cause and that he should therefore be impeached. In the charges presented to the Lords on the 8th of May 1626, he was accused of holding too many offices, of delivering English ships into French hands for use against the Huguenots, of selling honours and offices, of procuring titles for his kindred and, finally, of poisoning James I. The last of these charges refers to one of the most explosive conspiracies of the reign of King James I, one conveyed and fuelled by a pamphlet written by George Eglisham, in which he openly and directly accuses the Duke of Buckingham of having poisoned King James and several other members of the nobility, including the Marquis of Hamilton and the Earl of Southampton, to whom Bacon had previously dedicated his two Shakespeare poems, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucretia. Until recently, there was very little known about its author, George Eglisham, who had been variously described as a physician, polemicist, poet and philosopher. He settled in England in 1613 or 1614, and soon after he set up a medical practice in or around London and was afterwards appointed one of King James's personal physicians in 1616. 
His medical practice and attendance on James I at court would have no doubt have brought him into regular contact with Bacon, who had enjoyed a rapid rise during the Jacobean reign, appointed King's Counsel, Solicitor and Attorney General, before emulating his revered father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, with his appointment as Lord Keeper and Lord Chancellor of England. Curiously, or coincidentally, in the years leading up to the writing of the pamphlet in which he accuses Buckingham of the murder of King James, Eglisham was residing at Bacon House in Noble Street, Aldersgate, rebuilt and developed by Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon. In the work, usually known by the title The Forerunner of Revenge, George Eglisham, who had served King James as his personal physician for the past decade, petitioned both Charles I and Parliament to have the Duke of Buckingham put on trial for the alleged murder of James I, who he also accused of poisoning the Marquis of Hamilton and the Earl of Southampton, as well as several other members of the nobility. In his address in the work to the Parliament, Eglisham states, As all the judges of the kingdom and officers of state are his creatures or allies, or afraid to directly challenge him, and as the accused Buckingham is the most powerful person in the kingdom, Parliament is the only body that can hold him to account and deliver justice for the whole kingdom. For too long, Eglisham continues, Buckingham has been allowed at his own pleasure to procure the calling and breaking up of Parliament for his own purposes, placing or displacing the officers of justice of the council, of the King's court, of the courts of justice to his violent pleasure, and his ambitious, ambitious villainy moveth him. Then, turning to King Charles, he asks what hope is there for justice when everyone lives in real fear that if any allegation or complaint is made against Buckingham, the Duke will send a poisoner or assassin to murder him. The change and deterioration in the private relationship between King James and the Duke of Buckingham was as reported by Eglisham in The Forerunner of Revenge, the principal reason which eventually led to the murder by poisoning of King James. In the royal household, Buckingham intercepted diplomatic correspondence from foreign princes addressed to James, containing intelligence and information withheld from him, which the Duke replied to without the King's knowledge or consent. When the king eventually became aware of this serious breach in royal protocol and the betrayal of his trust, Buckingham realised King James was highly offended and that the king's mind was beginning to alter towards him. The king also, through the examination of some of the nobility and the Privy Council, discovered that Buckingham had said after his return from Spain that the king was an old man. It was now time for him to be at his rest and to be confined to some park to pass the rest of his time in hunting, and the prince to be crowned. The Duke of Buckingham knew his position as the favourite was now very precarious, and all his titles, preferment, privileges, property, estates and enormous wealth lay in the balance, and that his life, which he conceived was in a very mortal danger, would end with his neck severed from his head. As the time passed, Buckingham made a simple calculation and settled upon the decision to save his own skin by murdering the king. When the king fell sick with tertian ague, Buckingham took the opportunity to poison King James by giving the king some white powder under the pretense it was a medicinal remedy in a glass of wine without the knowledge of the king's physicians, resulting in a marked and serious deterioration in his condition. Some days later, his mother, the Countess of Buckingham, applied a plaster to the king's heart and breast, with which the king grew faint, short of breath, and suffered in great agony. Some of the physicians, after dinner, returned to see the king by the offensive smell of the plaster, perceived something to be about the king's hurt, king hurtful unto him, and searched what it could be found it out and exclaimed that the king was poisoned. 
Then Buckingham, entering, commanded the physicians out of the room, causing one to be committed prisoner to his own chamber and another to remove from court, quarrelled with others of the king's servants in the sick king's own presence, so far that he offered to draw his sword against them in the king's sight. The Sunday thereafter the king died, and Buckingham desired the physicians who attended the king to sign with their hands writs, a testimony, that the powder which he gave the king was a good, sufficient and safe medicine, which they refused to do. Immediately or soon after the explosive and sensational The Forerunner of Revenge was completed, a number of scribal manuscript copies began to circulate in London and around the Kingdom. In particular, it was being read by members of the Houses of Parliament, whose members impeached Buckingham on a series of charges, including the murder by poisoning of King James I. The fight against Buckingham in and out of Parliament was led by William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, then Grand Master of England, and his brother, Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, to whom Bacon had dedicated the Shakespeare First Folio, and Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, a future Grand Master of England, in whose house at Highgate Bacon supposedly died. The basic circumstances surrounding the death or murder of James I are not disputed. On two occasions, Buckingham and his mother gave the king some medicines not prescribed by the king's physicians, including two plasters and a potion. The first plaster secretly applied was left on the king for hours before it was detected. In the second instance, the potion and a plaster were administered with other physicians and attendants present. Eglisham alleges that the plaster and the potions were administered by Buckingham and his mother to deliberately poison King James, a view shared by some of the doctors and attendants. On the afternoon of the 24th of April 1626, the Parliamentary Committee began questioning the Royal Physicians, Henry Atkins, David Beaton, James Chambers, John Craig, Alexander Ramsey, Matthew Lister, William Harvey and John Moore. The most eagerly awaited witness was Craig, the Scotsman at the centre of the March 1625 stories about Buckingham's unauthorised intervention in the time leading up to the death or murder of King James. According to a March 1625 newsletter, Dr. Craig had challenged Buckingham after his suspicious behaviour and was clearly the doctor in the forerunner, committed prisoner to his own chamber, after exclaiming that the king was poisoned. However, the first witness on the 24th of April, Alexander Ramsay, infuriated King Charles. The Venetian ambassador reported that Charles had ordered that Ramsay remain a prisoner in his house for his unfavourable de deposition about the late king's death. And a newsletter writer observed that Ramsay spake something which extremely distasted his majesty, for which cause he is discorded, whose testimony, testimony was highly critical of Buckingham. It is clear that the royal physicians and other witnesses were being threatened and intimidated, and the arrest of Ramsay had a chilling effect on subsequent witnesses, who, as Elliot later noted, did not speak so fully as they were examined first. When Dr Cray gave his evidence, he revealed one very significant, telling and explosive piece of information. Craig testified that the doctor sent him and another physician to this king, i.e. Charles, to desire him that he would adv advise the Lord Buckingham to remit all the care to the physicians. They warned the prince that, finding that fit was higher than his other, they might ascribe it to those applications. In the newsletters, in Eglisham's secret history and in earlier testimony, Charles had been invisible. But Craig had now suggested that Charles knew the doctor's concerns and apparently had done nothing to stop the Duke's medical interference. A 
Another witness, Robert Ramsey, appeared before the committee on the 26th of April and presented them with very curious and strange tes testimony about several of his exchanges with an Irishman named Piers Butler, whom he linked to Buckingham and experimented with poisonous substances and potions. Probably believing his life was in danger, Butler took flight. For appearances, the Duke of Buckingham immediately sent instructions to Kent, ordering Butler's arrest, and similarly the Privy Council dispatched couriers to Bristol and Chester, ordering the seizure of Butler before he could escape to Ireland. His appearance at the hearings was remarkable, write Bellamy and Cogswell, for he was as close as Parliament would come to identifying the poison and mount bunk described in the forerunner. Indeed, by 1626, Butler had also acquired a reputation as a poisoner. Late that year, when Butler travelled towards Sweden under the pretext of making a pilgrimage, the Scotsman Sir James Spence warned the Swedish chief minister that Butler was a dangerous man, highly skilled in the arts of poison. Spence also reported that Butler was Buckingham's protégé, someone who, according to Venetian reports, received a handsome salary, perhaps as much as £1,000 a year for secret service. Robert Ramsay's brief testimony had dragged Piers Butler into the spotlight. Consciously or not, he had start startlingly confirmed elements of Eglisham's portrait of the Duke as the patron of witches and poisoners. On the 8th of June 1626, Buckingham finally responded to the charges against him, with a long statement prepared with legal advice from the Attorney General Sir Robert Heath and Nicholas Hyde. Like a good actor, he had long practised his lines and had long since lost the ability to distinguish between truth and lies, and it is doubtful if there was scarcely a single fool in the Lords who believed a word of it. With his well-prepared script, he then proceeded to answer the 13 charges made against him of various acts against the state, of bribery and corruption, grants of land and money for himself and his relatives, and procuring honours for family and friends. On the 13th and final charge of administering unauthorised medicine to King James in language betraying the influence of his lawyers and advisers, he insisted to the House that he had committed no crime or had done nothing wrong. During the proceedings in Parliament, Sir John Eliot and Sir Dudley Diggs had come within a whisker of insinuating the involvement of King Charles in the murder of his father. The decision by Charles not to allow Buckingham's impeachment to proceed to trial by dissolving Parliament a week later at the cost of a much needed subsidy bill, led more to believe or strongly suspect he was complicit with Buckingham in the foul act of killing a king, the very progenitor of his own royal blood. By foreclosing the impeachment process, Charles also left the mystery of James's death open. As accounts of the impeachment articles joined copies of Eglisham's secret history in ever broader circulation, the claim that James I had been murdered began to take deep root in popular political consciousness. Most talk continued to focus on Buckingham, but by sacrificing a subsidy bill to save the man who had been accused of involvement in his father's death, Charles had left himself open to suspicion. Some wondered what he had to hide. What Charles I might or was hiding, expressed by the contemporary Thomas Scott of Canterbury, not too long after the dissolution of Parliament, was the secret of secrets, which others so much speak of, that he conspired with Buckingham. He hath killed his own father and king, and hath ascended to the throne by murder and treason. For who doth not, if it be possible, revenge his father and predecessor's death? The hearings into the death or murder of James irreparably damaged the relationship between Charles I and Parliament, and his favourite, the Duke of Buckingham, was now the most hated and reviled man in the kingdom. Various anonymous poets and writers labelled him a contemptible poisoner and murderer that fuelled and ultimately led to his assassination at the hands of a soldier named John Felton, who stabbed him to death at the Greyhound pub in Portsmouth on the 23rd of August 1628.
The tract by George Eglisham, the forerunner of revenge, written around the time of Bacon's supposed death, was one of the critical impulses that led to the assassination of the widely loathed and reviled Duke of Buckingham, who he had directly accused of poisoning and murdering King James and other members of the nobility, including the Marquis of Hamilton and Henry Risley, the third Earl of Southampton. For Norman Chevers, in his little-known Did James I of England Die from the Effects of Poison or from Natural Causes, Eglisham's tract was the spark igniting that train which exploded in the Great Rebellion and in the death of King Charles I upon a scaffold at Whitehall, eventually resulting in the complete destruction of his monarchical rule and the life of a king about whom it was now being said publicly was involved or complicit in the murder of his father, James I. When civil war began in England in 1642, Eglisham's pamphlet reappeared in multiple new editions to harden the resolve of those now taking up arms against Charles I. Early in 1648, as many yearned for a negotiated settlement, radicals in the army and parliament used variations on the secret history, not only to end negotiations with Charles, but also to implicate him in his father's death. A few months later, claims about James's murder hung over the debates about his son's trial. Indeed, by the time of Charles's execution in January 1649, James's murder had become a revolutionary shibboleth and it figured prominently in the foundational mythology of the English Republic, repeatedly invoked by the regime's propagandists to condemn the Stuart monarchy and defend the free state. The Grand Illusion, his final drama. According to every single one of the orthodox biographers of Francis Bacon, starting with the earliest by Pierre Ambios, Peter Boner and Dr William Rawley, all the way through to spreading standard seven volume Life and Letters, to the recent biographies by Jardine and Stewart and Robert P. Ellis, as well as the latest entry for him in the ODMB, the great philosopher died on the 9th of April 1626. The first printed account of his death appeared in a curious French edition of his Silver Silverum, entitled Histoire naturelle de Monsieur François Bacon, to which is prefixed a life of Bacon that is conspicuously lacking in any hard facts or biographical detail. He again applied himself, as before, to unravel the great secrets of nature, and as he was engaged during a severe frost in, in observing some particular effects of cold, having stayed too long in the open, and forgetting that his age made him incapable, incapable of bearing such severities, the cold, acting the more easily on a body whose powers were already reduced by old age, drove out all that remained of natural heat, and reduced him to the last condition that is always reached by great men only too soon. Thus ended this great man, whom England could place alone as the equal of the best of all the previous centuries. The next Life of Bacon was written by Peter Boner, who served as his apothecary and secretary until March 1623, when he departed for Holland, leaving Bacon and his wife in good health. The Life appeared in a Dutch edition of Bacon, es Bacon Essays in 1646, and in its dedication to the Prince of Orange, its translator Boner plainly intimates that there are things he knows about his former master he knows not to publicly utter or state in print. Please do not think it strange that I offer you, as a very small proof of my duty, the writings of that very celebrated luminary, Lord Franciscus Bacon, Chancellor of England, translated into our Dutch tongue by me, formerly his servant. It is that author praised by all the world and whose writings are to be found in several countries in several languages. But, not to let your highness wait any longer, it is that author about whom it is better not to speak than to say too much.
In keeping with his stated modus operandi, Boner provides us with the brief statement that Bacon died on the 9th of April 1626. It would be desirable, he having died anno 1626 on the 9th of April, being old 66 years, that a statue or a bronzen image were erected in his country to his honour and name, as a noteworthy example and pattern for everyone of all virtue, gentleness, peacefulness and patience. His first English editor and biographer, Dr William Rawley, who lived with Bacon for the last 10 years of his recorded life from 1616 to 1626, was privy to the secrets of the life and writings of his Rosicrucian master. In the 1657 edition of the collected volume of Bacon's writings, the Resuscitatia, Dr Rawley prefixed to it the first English life of Bacon. In his address to the reader, Dr. Rawley informs the initiated, in regard of the distance of the time since his lordship's days, whereby I shall not tread too near upon the heels of truth, or of the passages and persons then concerned. For as he clearly states, there are secrets about Bacon that are not communicable to the public. In his version of Bacon's death, Dr Rawley states that he died at the Earl of Arundel's house in Highgate near London. He died on the 9th day of April in the year 1626 in the early morning of the day, then celebrated for our Saviour's resurrection in the 66th year of his age at the Earl of Arundel's house in Highgate near London, to which place he casually repaired about a week before, God so ordaining that he should die there of a gentle fever, accidentally accompanied with a great cold, whereby the defluxion of rheum fell so plentiful upon his breast that he died by suffocation. The antiquary and biographer John Aubrey later claimed that the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, Bacon's secretary and translator of a number of his essays, provided him with another version of the circumstances surrounding Bacon's death. Mr Hobbs told me that the cause of his Lordship's death was trying an experiment. As he was taking the air in a coach with Dr Witherbourne, a Scotchman, physician to the King, towards Highgate, snow lay on the ground. And it came into my Lord's thoughts, why flesh might not be preserved in snow as in salt. They were resolved they would try the experiment presently. They alighted out of the coach and went into a poor woman's house at the bottom of Highgate Hill and bought a hen and made the woman exenterate it, and then stuffed the body with snow, and my lord did help to do it himself. The snow so chilled him that he immediately fell so extremely ill that he could not return to his lodging, I suppose then at Gray's Inn, but went to the Earl of Arundel's house at Highgate, where they put him into a good bed warmed with a pan. But it was a damp bed that had not been lain in about a year before, which gave him such a cold that in two or three days, as I remember Mr Hobbs told me, he died of suffocation. In his brief account of Bacon in the History of the Worthies of England, the English churchman and historian Thomas Fuller provides no more than a single sentence about Bacon's death. He died Anno Domini 1626 in the house of the Earl of the Arundel at Highgate. With David Lloyd in the Statesmen and Favourites of England, more or less repeating rawly, he died of a gentle fever, accompanied with a choking defluxion and cold April the 9th, being Easter Day 1626, 66th year of his age in the Earl of Arundel's house at Highgate near London. In their widely critically acclaimed standard single volume biography, The Troubled Life of Francis Bacon, its authors, Professor Jardine and Stewart, state that accounts of the circumstances surrounding a prominent death in early modern England need to be taken with more than a pinch of salt, as do the carefully constructed composite story from Ambios, Hobbes, Vire Aubrey and Rawley, to which can be added the brief accounts or stories given above by Boner, Fuller and Lloyd. The precise word story is crucial and indicative. 
In his brief account of Bacon's death, his standard biographer Spedin used the word story twice. The story is that the idea suddenly occurring to him, he stopped the coach, alighted at a cottage, obtained a hen, and the story goes on to say that the housekeeper, in his anxiety to entertain him handsomely, had put him in the best bed, which, having been long unused in the absence of the family, was damp in spite of the warming pan. In his account of Bacon's death, Professor Ellis uses the word story four times in the first paragraph, with the word again used by Professor Peltonin in his Life of Bacon in the ODNB. According to the story, in an unseasonable cold spring, it had occurred to Bacon to test whether snow would preserve flesh for, from putrefaction, as salt does. Put another way, these very carefully constructed composite stories of his death are fictions, as is his own written account of the circumstances leading up to it. In what is known as his last letter addressed to the future Grand Master of England, the Earl of Arundel, who, with his fellow Grand Master of England, the Earl of Pembroke and Earl of Montgomery, led the fight against Buckingham, he sets the scene just like in one of his Shakespeare dramas. My very good Lord, I was likely to have had the fortune of Caius Plinius the Elder, who lost his life by trying an experiment about the burning of the mountain Vesuvius. For I also was desirous to try an experiment or two, touching the conservation and induration of bodies. As for the experiment itself, it succeeded excellently well, but in the journey between London and Highgate, I was taken with such a fit of casting as I knew not whether it were the stone or some surfeit or cold, or indeed a touch of them all three. But when I came to your Lordship's house, I was not able to go back, and therefore was forced to take up my lodgings here, where your housekeeper is very careful and diligent about me which I assure myself your Lordship will not only pardon towards him, but think the better of him for it, for indeed your Lordship's house was happy to me, and I kiss your noble hands for the welcome which I am sure you, you give me to it. I know how unfit it is for me to write to your Lordship with any other hand than mine own, but in truth my fingers are so disjointed with the fit of sickness that I cannot steadily hold a pen. Despite the accounts given by Ambios, Aubrey and Rawley being acknowledged as carefully constructed composite stories, modern orthodox Bacon's biographers still to the present day simply repeat the story, often devoting only a few lines or one or two paragraphs in their accounts of his death, that he died at the Earl of Arundel's house at Highgate on the 9th of April 1626. Whereas, hidden from the rest of the world, a large number of Baconian scholars, mostly in the private journal of Baconiana, as well as other out-of-the-way little-known publications, have for more than a century questioned, disputed and presented a whole range of evidence which undermines, confutes and overturns the last great secret of Bacon's life, namely his supposed death in April 1626. In their recent biography, The Troubled Life of Francis Bacon, its authors, Professors Jardine and Stewart, suggest that rather than dying of severe cold or the like, as stated by Ambios, Dr. Rawley and Aubrey, in the last days of his life, Bacon tells Arundel, in a barely veiled illusion, that he had been inhaling remedial substances in London, in an attempt to alleviate the symptoms of ill health and, he hopes, help prolong his life. A course of events which succeeded excellently well, except that on the journey home he was suddenly taken violently ill with a fit of casting, and forced to break his journey at Arundel's house. Here he remained dying there shortly thereafter. To substantiate their interpretation that Bacon had first-hand experience of opiates, Jardine and Stewart reproduce a series of citations from Silver Silverum, where he specifically discusses taking opiates by inhalation for the prolongation of life, and the history of life and death in which Bacon also gives a list of opiates. 
In the history of life and death, through the sections numbered 14 to 37, Bacon discusses in some detail the varying uses and effects of opium and opiates. Opium is by far the most powerful and effectual means for condensing the spirits by flight. And next to it, opiates and soporifics, a substance that induces drowsiness or sleep in general. Further adding, let no one wonder at the variety of its uses. Writing decades earlier, the prolific Baconian Parker Woodward antip anticipated them and agreed that Bacon, in his last letter to his Rosicrucian Freemasonry brother, the Earl of Arundel, in a scarcely veiled allusion, hints at taking opiates, whereas he arrived at a completely different conclusion. Putting this fragmentary information together, it would appear that Bacon planned to simulate death at Highgate, and that the experiment which he said in the Arundel letter nearly cost him his life, was the induration of his own body by opium. As seemingly dead, he was most probably shown to the caretaker, and possibly to others, by his friendly medical men and Sir Julius Caesar. While in the shell or rough coffin in which his touched spirit was retreating, he, as may be assumed, nearly did die. At some friendly house he would have been restored to health. Then he went abroad as secretly as possible. In Reminiscences of a Baconian, Kate Prescott, an avid researcher into the authorship of the Shakespeare works and owner of 12 copies of Arcadia, attributed to Sir Philip Sidney, who she believed was a mass for Bacon, tells how her husband, Dr Prescott, deciphered the following statement by Bacon enciphered in one of their original copies of it. Fearing for my life, lest King Charles should kill me, I feigned death, being put to sleep with opium. I was sewn in a sheet and taken to St Michael's Church, where I was found 17 long hours later by Sir Thomas Mutis, who brought me back to life by the injection of nightshade into my rectum. I escaped from England dressed as a serving maid of Lady Delaware. A similar process is described by Bacon in Romeo and Juliet, where Juliet is instructed on how to feign her own death. In his last will, published on the 19th of December 1625, in the presence of his first editor, Dr William Rawley, Bacon expressed a desire to be buried in St Michael's Church. For my burial, I desire it may be in St Michael's Church, near St Albans. There was my mother buried, and it is the parish church of my mansion house at Gorhambury, and it is the only Christian church within the walls of Old Verulam. I would have the charge of my funeral not to exceed £300 at the most. There could not be a more appropriate setting for this grand Rosicrucian Freemasonic illusion. According to the central legend of Freemasonry, the craft was introduced into England in the time of St Alban, who lived in the 3rd century, from whom the town of St Albans takes its name, after whom Lord Bacon took his title Viscount St Alban. Old Verulam is the site of the old Roman town of Verulamium, and within the city walls of the old city of Verulam, Bacon built Verulam House, within the grounds of his Gorhambury estate, which may have been used as an early Rosicrucian Freemasonry lodge. The legend of St Alban is presented as follows by Anderson in the official The New Book of Constitutions of the Ancient and Honourable Fraternity of Free and Accepted Masons. AD 287. Carausius encouraged the craft, particularly at Verulam, now St Alban's Hertfordshire, by the worthy knight Albinus. St Alban loved Masons well and cherished them much. He, he also obtained of the King the Charter for the Freemasons, for to hold a general council and gave it the name of Assembly, and was thereat himself as Grand Master, and helped to make Masons and gave them good charges. When Diocletian and Maximin abdicated, AD 303.
The legend of St Alban, the supposed founder of Freemasonry in England, as presented by Dr Anderson, is framed by two numbers, 287 and 303. If the null naught is dropped from 303, it leaves 33 bacon in simple cipher, and the number 287 represents Fra Rosy Cross in K cipher. Thus, Dr James Anderson, in the new Book of Constitutions, officially sanctioned by the Grand Lodge of England, secretly communicates to the high initiates and those able to, de to decipher it that the true founding father of the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood is Francis Bacon, Viscount St Alban. In the first English life of Bacon, written by his Rosicrucian Freemasonry brother, Dr. William Rawley, who lived with him for the last 10 years of his recorded life, tells the rest of the world and posterity his Grandmaster Lord Bacon. Was buried in St. Michael's Church and St. at St. Albans, being the place designed for his burial by his last will and testament where he hath a monument erected for him of white marble by the care and gratitude of Sir Thomas Mutis, Knight, formerly his Lordship's secretary, afterwards clerk of the King's Honourable Privy Council under two kings, representing his full portraiture in the posture of studying with an inscription composed by that accomplished gentleman and rare wit Sir Henry Wotton. In following Dr Rawley, both Thomas Fuller and David Lloyd also state that Bacon was buried at St Michael's Church in Old Verulam, with a monument erected for him by his private secretary Sir Thomas Mutis and Sir Henry Wotton. There is, however, no documentation, nor account or report of his funeral or burial, and the registry for the entry for burials at St Michael's Church prior to 1643 are missing. Transcripts of them are preserved in the Archdeaconry Court of St Albans Abbey from 1572 to 1600 and from 1629 to 1630, which omits the year Bacon is said to have been buried at St Michael's Church. Nor is there any item for funeral expenses in the accounts of administration of Bacon's estate. There is also no mention of his funeral in any contemporary works, documents, letters, diaries or a single report from anyone whatsoever who attended the funeral of the greatest and arguably the most famous man of the period. It is reported by Hamon Lestrange in the reign of King Charles that when Sir Thomas Mutis died in 1649 that during his funeral in St Michael's Church it was his lot to be inhumed so nigh his Lord's sepulchre that in forming his grave part of the Viscount's body was exposed to view, which being spied by a doctor of physic, he demanded the head be given to him, and did most shamefully disport himself with that shell which was some while the continent of so vast treasure of knowledge. This was presumably the source of Thomas Fuller's in the history of the worthies of England. I have read that his grave being occasionally opened, his skull, the relic of civil veneration, was by one king, a doctor of physic, made the object of scorn and contempt. But he, who then derided the dead, is since becoming the laughing stock of the living. According to John Aubrey, a few decades later, this October 1681, it rang over all St Albans that Sir, Sir Harbottle Grimston, Master of the Rolls, had removed the coffin of this most renowned Lord Chancellor to make room for his own to lie in the vault there at St Michael's Church. There was, however, observes Parker Woodward, plenty of room in the crypt for many bodies, so the report was most probably to account for the absence of Bacon's coffin corpse from St Michael's Church. These self-evidently absurd statements were all part of the same carefully constructed charade to maintain the illusion that Bacon died in 1626, followed by his funeral and burial at St Michael's Church. There was no funeral or burial at St Michael's Church in 1626. 
When the vaults were examined hundreds of years later, nothing was found of Bacon's coffin and remains in St Michael's Church. A statement confirming this was provided by the Earl of Verulam, then the current occupant of Gorhambury, to C.M. Pott in a 1904 edition of Baconiana. I received a most positive assurance from the late Earl of Verulam at Gorhambury that Francis St Alban was not, as had been supposed, buried in the vaults of the Church of St Michael's. Those vaults were thoroughly examined by himself and a party of experts, and every coffin was seen and identified before the final bricking up of these crypts by order of the Board of War Works. Bacon was certainly not buried there. In researching his work, Francis Bacon, Professor Coquillet prefaces it with a rather delightful account of his visit to Gorhambury. He was met at the entrance of the estate by the gatekeeper, and on his long walk up to the house, the estate's gamekeeper. He was aware that the life and writings of Bacon were entangled in controversy and mystery, and that even the place of his burial is shrouded in mystery. It was she who first told me that Bacon was not buried where he was supposed to be. Bacon's last will certainly stipulated that he be buried at St Michael's, and for many years it was assumed that he lay under his monument in the north wall of the chancel. Recent repairs to that wall, however, have revealed that Bacon is not there. The same is also repeated by Professors Jardine and Stewart in The Troubled Life of Francis Bacon, who, like Professor Coquillet, were either ignorant of the information as cited above by C.M. Pott, and afterwards found in numerous other later Baconiana articles and full-length Baconian biographies, that Bacon was not buried there, or they did not, for some reason, wish to draw attention to these accounts. No record exists of his burial, and it has recently been revealed that Bacon is not buried under the monument in the north wall of the chancel, as had been assumed. In the course of her researches for the groundbreaking Francis Bacon a biography, Jean Overton Fuller also visited Gorhambury. She was aided in her inquiries by the Countess of Verulam and the Earl of Verulam's secretary, Nora King. One of the important matters she raised with them was the question of just where Bacon was actually buried. His coffin, they informed her, was not as previously believed under the statue erected by Sir Thomas Mutis, and the family were, contra Dr Rawley, Fuller and Lloyd, certain Bacon was never interred in St Michael's Church. It has not been possible to ascertain the place of Bacon's burial. It used to be thought it was under the statue erected to him by Mutis in St Michael's, Gorhambury, but recent excavations reveal there was no coffin. The inscription reads, not hic jacet, but sic sedabat, and the present Verulam family are adamant he was never interred there. The relevant page from the burial register is missing, and it has not been possible to, dis to discover any reference to his funeral. The monument of Bacon at St Michael's Church was erected by his private secretary and member of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, Sir Thomas Mutis, replete with an epitaph written by his cousin, Sir Thomas Watton, of the English Secret Service and also a member of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood. This is the original Latin inscription on the epitaph. The majority of Bacon's papers, letters and literary manuscripts in the possession of Dr Rawley were passed to his second editor, Dr Tennyson, afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury. He was familiar with the secrets of Bacon's life and writings, including his authorship of the Shakespeare works, his cipher systems, as well as being privy to the truth about his supposed death. In his Baconiana, Dr Tennyson, a member of Bacon's Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, gives a translation of the Latin epitaph as follows.
The key line in this translation to be noted is, let the companions be parted. It is not known who designed and built the Bacon Monument at St Michael's Church, though it has been suggested that in all likelihood it was carried out by the sculptor and master mason Nicholas Stone, a senior figure in the Mason's Company of London. He carried out as master mason several designs of Bacon's close friend, Grand Master of England, Inigo Jones, including the banqueting house at Whitehall. When Inigo Jones was first appointed Grand Master of England, his two appointed Grand Wardens were William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and Nicholas Stone, the sculptor. When the Earl of Pembroke was chosen as the Grand Master of England in 1618, Inigo Jones was appointed his Deputy Grand Master, and he was still sitting in Solomon's chair when Bacon dedicated the Shakespeare first folio to Pembroke and his brother Philip Herbert, the Earl of Montgomery. The Earl of Pembroke demitted in 1630, and he was followed in quick succession by Henry, Earl of Danby, and then Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, as Grand Master of England, in whose house Bacon supposedly died, with Inigo Jones serving as his deputy Grand Master. There seems every chance that Inigo Jones and Nicholas Stone were directly involved in the design and construction of the Bacon Monument at St Michael's Church. The translation by Tennyson of Compositor Solventur as Let the Can Companions Be Parted alludes to the Freemasonic Royal Arch Companion where members of the order are referred to as excellent companions. The enigmatic figure of Bacon on the monument at St Michael's Church depicts him as Grand Master of the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood. In his biography of Bacon, Alfred Dodd, himself a learned and lifelong Freemason, observes, The statue depicts Francis Bacon in a favourite attitude, seated in his chair ruminating and about to dictate. Thus leaning on mine elbow, I begin. The roses on his shoes denote his connection with the Rosicrucian fraternity. The square chair, the gauntlets, the hat, as a worshipful master among Masons. In the months following Bacon's supposed death to the world, his private secretary and Rosicrucian brother, Dr. Rawley, compiled and published a commemorative work in his honour entitled The Memori, otherwise known as the Mains Verilumiani. This rare work contains 32 Latin verses in praise of Bacon, with an introduction by his Rosicrucian brother, Dr. Rawley. The orthodox editors and biographers of Bacon have continued to suppress and pass over the contents of this critically important work to the present day. Several of these verses portray Bacon as a concealed supreme poet and dramatist of comedies and tragedies, written under the pseudonym Shakespeare. As revealing as these remarkable verses already are in his address to the reader, Dr. Rawley plainly states that he had deliberately withheld other verses from public view, consistent with his later statement in the preface to the Resuscitato, in which he stated there are some things that are not openly communicable to the public. What my Lord, the Right Honourable Viscount St Alban, valued most, that he should be dear to seats of learning and to men of letters, that, I believe, he has secured, since these tokens of love and memorials of sorrow prove how much his loss grieves their heart. And indeed, with no stinted hand, have the muses bestowed on him this emblem, for very many poems, and the best too, I withhold from publication. But since he himself delighted not in quantity, no great quantity have I put forth. Moreover, let it suffice to have laid, as it were, these foundations in the name of the present age. This fabric I think every age will embellish and enlarge. But to what age it is given to put the last touch, that is known to God only and the fates. It was planned and put out that Bacon died on Easter Sunday. As Dr. Rawley, aware of its hidden significance, put it, then celebrated for our Saviour's resurrection. 
This being a patently clear reference to the fact that on Easter or Resurrection Sunday, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Thus, in other words, Bacon died to the profane world and metaphorically rose again, and rather than ascend to heaven, he secretly slipped away to live the rest of his life in secret and obscurity. In a memorial verse penned by his inward friend, the metaphysical poet George Herbert, kinsman of William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, Grandmaster of England, and Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, to whom Bacon dedicated the Shakespeare First Folio, in an allusion to his feigned death, writes, It is evident in April alone you could have died. In the poet poetical words of the poet and dramatist Thomas Randolph, Thus the newborn phoenix regards the ashes from which it springs, and the bloom of youth returns to aged Aeson. So too, Verulam restored, boasts its new walls, and thence hopes for its ancient renown. The phoenix being the long-lived immortal bird, a symbol of renewal and rebirth, that rises from its ashes and is born again, one beloved by his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood. In what appears to be an allusion to the fact that Bacon was not buried in St Michael's Church, one of its anonymous authors writes, Think you, foolish traveller, that the leader of the choir of the Muses and of Phoebus is interned in the cold marble. Away, you are deceived. And Henry Ockley of Trinity College, Cambridge, emphatically states, He is gone, he is gone. It suffices for my woe to have uttered this. I have not said he is dead. There are also some virtually unknown letters which are of great value to the matter at hand that serve to indicate and confirm that Bacon did not die in 1626. The truth of his death was known to certain members of his trusted inner circle and high initiates of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood. One of those persons we might well expect to be in the secret and have knowledge of, of it was his lifelong inward friend Sir Toby Matthew, whom Bacon famously described as his alter ego or other self. Five years after his own death, a collection of letters made by Sir Toby Matthew Knight with an epistle dedicatory prefix to it by John Donne was publi published in 1660. For reasons of secrecy, Sir Toby Matthew went to a good deal of trouble to deliberately remove dates and names and other particulars which may have served to identify the persons spoke of in the letters, as well as to obscure their content and import. One of these stripped of the names of all persons and particulars that is written in Bacon's recognisable prose style begins, I confess myself to have been rather confounded than comforted by your noble and kind letter, which did so very gallantly prevent and surprise me. Before proceeding to say, as for the political or moral, the same words used in the various titles of his essays, i.e. civil, political and moral, I dare not speak a word, and I wish I had not caused so much as to think of it. Followed by... A.B. was wont to tell me still, when I was alive, that he prayed God to make me an honest man, but you must desire him now to alter his prayer, for I find myself already to be so honest that I am the worst for it. With the statement, when I was alive, clearly implying that he had died to the rest of the world, in what may be described as his first, de first death, but was clearly still very much alive, evidenced by the fact of writing this letter. There resides in the Lambeth Palace Library, among the Gibson manuscripts, a little-known letter written by Sir Thomas Mutis to Bacon of the utmost historical importance, revealing that Bacon did not die in 1626 and was alive many years after his supposed death. The letter was printed by his editor Basil Montague, whose ancestor was Grandmaster of England, in the last two pages of the twelfth volume of his sixteen-volume edition of the works of Francis Bacon in 1830.
The contents of the letter from Mutis to Bacon confirms that it dates from the 11th of October 1631. The letter, preserved in the Bacon Collection at the Lambeth Palace Library, signed TM, written in the handwriting of Sir Thomas Mutis and headed by Bacon's editor Basil Montague to Bacon, Thomas Mutis to Lords and Album, is in the MS not addressed to its recipient by name. Yet it requires little difficulty to demonstrate that the letter, as headed and presented by Montague as written by Mutis to Bacon, was written, in fact, to his Rosicrucian master Bacon. Firstly, let us look at the date of the letter. It will be noticed that the letter is only dated 11th of October, but its internal evidence shows the year to have been 1631, since the sacking of the Protestant city of Magdeburg by the imperial forces of the Catholic League under the command of Johann Sirlis, Count of Tilly, took place on the 20th of May 1631, resulting reportedly in the death of around 20,000 men. In revenge for this, Sir Thomas Mutis relates the current news from Germany of a great battle in which Tilly himself was mortally wounded and pursued by the King of Sweden. The defeat of Tilly occurred at the Battle of Brightonfield on 17th of September 1631 by the Protestant forces led by Gustavus Adolphus, King of Sweden. This proves beyond all doubt that the letter was written on the 11th of October 1631. The contents of the letter are just what we might expect from Sir Thomas Mutis writing to his master, Lord of St Alban, while living in secret abroad. All his life, Bacon had been a man of the law, successively serving as Solicitor General, Attorney General, Lord Keeper and Lord Chancellor of England. In the letter, his devoted servant and private secretary, Sir Thomas Mutis, informs him of the chances of the candidates for some of the high legal offices. Sir Robert Heath, then Attorney General, a creature of the Duke of Buckingham, was made Lord Chief Justice on the 26th of October 1631, and Sir Thomas Richardson appointed Chief Justice of the King's Bench on 24th of October 1631, both of them well known to Bacon. As for his prediction as to the position of the Attorney General, he states that Sir John Finch is out of the running. Sir John Finch was a prominent member of Gray's Inn, who from 1614 was patronised by Bacon. He defended Bacon in, in his impeachment trial in 1621 and was appointed by Bacon as an executor of his estate in his 1621 will, in which Bacon bequeathed him his chambers at Gray's Inn. Throughout his legal and political career as Speaker of the House of Commons and afterwards as the Chief Justice of the Court of Common Pleas, he worked tirelessly trying to advance Bacon's programme for law reform. His prediction that Banks would most probably secure the position of Attorney General was consistent with everyone else's expectation at the time, but it so turned out that on the 27th of October it was awarded to William Noy. He too, by 1614, had attracted the attention of Bacon, then Attorney General, who nominated him an official recorder for the Courts of Common Law. Under Bacon's supervision, Noy was appointed to a committee of distinguished lawyers and judges to undertake a comprehensive rev review of English st statute law as part of Bacon's broader programme for law reform. It is also clear from the letter that Bacon had been in regular contact with a Mr Maxwell who was acting at Bacon's unknown direction which Mutis was privy to, which as he tells us he performed at Windsor. This Mr Maxwell is an obscure figure whose identity is uncertain. He is most likely to be the Mr Maxwell referred to in a letter held at Lambeth Palace Library on the back of which in Mutis' hand as dictated by Bacon is the line Mr Maxwell that I am sorry that so soon as I came to know him and to be beholding to him I wanted power to be of use to him. All of which provides conclusive evidence of it being addressed to Bacon and that he was well and truly alive in 1631.
While he was living in retreat, several Baconians have pointed to a number of works or literary ventures abroad, which Bacon was, was involved in the preparation, writing, revision and publication. Parker Woodward believes that in 1629-30 to 30, he was busy preparing the French edition of his Silver Silverum, printed in 1631, the same year Sir Thomas Mutis wrote the above letter to Lord St Alban, suggesting that at the time Bacon may have been in Paris, living incognito with one or more members of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood. The 1631 edition contained the first ever Life of Bacon, although a number of Baconians have suggested it was written by Bacon himself. Its translator, Granville C. Cunningham, observes, Parts of the work are so intimate and so introspective that the thought has come to me that I was dealing not with Ambios, but with Bacon's own apology for his life. One seems to catch the personal note of bitterness, grieving over unrealised hopes and shattered ambitions. In the period, Bacon was exchanging letters with his private secretary and Rosicrucian brother, Sir Thomas Mutis. He was also very busy revising, amending and correcting the second folio of the Shakespeare works. The second edition of the Shakespeare plays was printed by Thomas Coates, who took over the printing business of the printers of the first folio, William and Isaac Jaggard, on the 29th of June 1627, after acquiring the business and copyrights from his widow, Dorothy Jaggard. At the time of Bacon's feigned death in April 1626, the Jaggards, Elizabeth, wife of John, of John Jaggard, and William and Isaac Jaggard, owned the copyright to Bacon's essays and part of the copyright to the Shakespeare First Folio. William Jaggard, who printed at least one of the several editions of Bacon's essays published by his brother John Jaggard, had taken on Thomas Coates as an apprentice in 1597. Coates printed Bacon certain considerations in 1604, and he and the Jaggards enjoyed a private and professional relationship with Bacon until at least his feigned death in 1626. The preliminaries of the second folio, reprints from the first folio, the dedication to William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, Grandmaster of England, and his brother Philip, Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, the address in the names of Hemming and Condell, Ben Jonson's verses, and the poems by Leonard Diggs and Hugh Holland. To this it adds John Milton's first published poem entitled An Epitaph on the Admirable Poet W. Shakespeare, and below it an unsigned poem upon the effigies of my worthy friend, the author, Master William Shakespeare and his works. Furthermore, the second folio contains another poem not found in the first folio, which for 400 years has remained virtually unknown to the rest of the world, entitled On Worthy Master Shakespeare and His Poems, signed The Friendly Admirer of His Endowments, JMS. This is a very special poem. The quality of the poem, writes the Shakespeare scholar Oscar James Campbell, is of such high order as to suggest a poet of the first rank, he is certainly correct. The poem is written by the supreme master poet himself. The first thing to notice about this long poem is the Freemasonic language of its title, Unworthy Master Shakespeare, indicating that the true Shakespeare is a member of the Freemasonry Brotherhood. In modern terms, a worthy Freemason can find himself elevated to the position of worshipful master of the lodge who wears a Masonic hat. Most of the portraits of Bacon show him wearing his master's hat to signify his rank and status. In Bacon's case, it was to signify to the initiated he was Grand Master of all Freemasons, whose works, including his Shakespeare plays, are replete with Masonic frontispieces, dedications, addresses and symbols, all couched in Masonic language, who in one line from the poem, creates and rules a world and works upon mankind by secret engines. It will be noticed that the first line within the large capital A has 33 italic letters. 33 is Bacon in simple cipher. 
and that the first paragraph break comes after 39 lines, 39 F. Bacon in simple cipher. The anonymous poem is signed the friendly admirer of his endowments, comprising 33 letters, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. This is followed with three cryptic initials, JMS. In the 24 letter Elizabethan alphabet, J, I and J and U and V are interchangeable. The letters J, M, S have a numerical value of 39 F Bacon in simple cipher. Unlike the Shakespeare first folio, which is the primary focus of orthodox scholars and those interested in the true authorship of the Shakespeare works, which has been forensically scrutinised from almost every conceivable perspective, comparatively the second Shakespeare folio has attracted very little critical attention. And what attention it has received, little of it has entered into the mainstream of the Shakespearean canon. In 1937, in their relatively little-known standard work, M. W. Black and M. A. Sharper, in their monumental Shakespeare's 17th century editors, subjected the first and second folios to a detailed comparative analysis in which they revealed there are 1,679 changes in the second Shakespeare folio, folio in what was an attempt to clarify, correct and improve the text. The changes pertaining to the action of the plays are nearly all indications of entrances and exits and reassignments of speeches. The most noteworthy accomplishment of the editor in this department is his care in marking a character's entering or leaving the stage. 73 entrances and exits are correctly added and one is correctly omitted. The changes affecting the meter are among the most remarkable features of the work of the editor. There are 360 of them in folio 2. There are a few passages in which he converted prose into verse. The changes which we classify under the heading of style have to do chiefly with matters of taste and propriety, the choice and the form of words. The editor of F2, who was not in the least deterred by the scruples which forbid modern editors to alter the text unless they think they are restoring what Shakespeare wrote, evidently had definite ideas about certain matters of usage which, in justice to him, must be called intelligible. The rectifications of the orthography of scraps of foreign languages in the plays and of proper names are also interesting and sometimes clever. The editor's Latin was evidently good, good enough at least to recover quotations from Mantuan, Ovid, Virgil and Horace. His Italian and French less good, though he made some partial corrections in these languages too. The very suggestion that the enormous 1,679 amendments, revisions, corrections and improvements concerning the dramatic action, stagecraft, metre, verse, language and style in the second Shakespeare folio were executed by a combination of the printer, anonymous compositors and correctors or some unknown editor is simply absurd. Not only would these imagined individuals needed to have been classical scholars and linguists, Greek, Latin, French and Italian languages familiar to Bacon, they would have had to possess a necessary sophisticated comprehension of English grammar and syntax. They would also have needed to possess a practised and superior literary skill to write and rewrite lines and exercise stylistic preferences. The printer, compositors, correctors or the editor, or any combination thereof, would also have needed to have been seasoned poets and dramatists and have professional and practical experience of the theatre to equip them with the knowledge and skills to introduce the appropriate speech prefixes and various stage directions. Perhaps most importantly, the revisions, corrections and improvements required the unnamed and unidentified individuals to inhabit the very structure and architecture of the plays, as well as possess an intimate familiarity with their fictive world, the kind of course known and understood by the author himself, the very person responsible for them. He was even thoughtful enough to leave a calling card. All we had to do was open our minds and our eyes.
There are several variants of the title page of the second Shakespeare folio, of which I have taken one at random to re reveal its secret Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. The title page is made up of three parts, a top section, a middle section, boasting the Drochat portrait, and a bottom section. In the top section, there is a total of 111 letters above the portrait, 111 Bacon in K cipher. It will also be observed that it also contains eight non-block Roman words, 111 minus 8 equals 103, Shakespearean simple cipher. In the bottom section of the page, not including the, bot uh, the block italic word London, there are 29 words and four digits in the date. 29 plus 4 equals 33, Bacon in simple cipher, which added to the six letters in London, 33 plus 6 equals 39, F Bacon in simple cipher. Furthermore, the 21 Roman words and the addition of the date, 1 plus 6 plus 3 plus 2 equals 12, 21 plus 12 equals 33, Bacon in simple cipher. In total, the bottom section contains 132 letters, which, plus the Drochat portrait, 132 plus 1 equals 133, a double simple cipher for Francis Bacon, 133. The whole page contains 170 Roman letters, 12 Italic words and a single portrait. 170 minus 12 minus 1 equals 157 Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher. In 1640 appeared of the advancement of learning, interpreted by Gilbert Watts, that some Baconian scholars have correctly suggested was prepared and edited by Bacon himself. Prefix to the 1640 edition is an engraving by W. Marshall of Bacon wearing his Masonic hat, seated at a table with pen in his hand, composing the six books of Instauratio Magna, with books one and two to his left, and the other volumes three to six placed on the shelf above him. Adjacent to the portrait of Bacon is an engraved frontispiece that is framed by two Masonic pillars, which, as Alfred Dodd, himself a Freemason, points out, indicates quite clearly his connection with modern Freemasonry by signs and symbols. There are the two great pillars, the terrestrial and celestial globes, the sun and moon, the curtain, which still veils the floor of the lodge in many old lodges, the secret grip of the clasped hands, the pyramids of the higher degrees, the lighted candles and the symbolic owls that denote wisdom and secrets. The six parts of the great installation are to be seen as Francis Bacon's complete work, three parts being placed under the visible globe and three under the invisible globe, thus indicating that three were written openly and three secretly. His concealed works were the Shakespeare plays, the Rosicrucian manifestos and the complete rituals on which he founded the Masonic Brotherhood. His invisible Rosicrucian Brotherhood were also busy working behind the scenes on the first full-length work in English on cryptography, entitled Mercury or the Secret and Swift Messenger, issued in 1641, attributed to the Bacon disciple and Rosicrucian brother, Dr John Wilkins, one of the key founders of the Baconian Rosicrucian Royal Society. It contains a very curious verse addressed to the unknown author. By hiding who thou art, seek not to miss the glory due to such a work as this, but set thy name that thou mayst have the praise, lest to the unknown God we altars raise. The Baconian Parker Woodward maintained the above work had been fathered upon Wilkins, and in reality it was written by Bacon, whose famous biliteral cipher is also set out in Mercury or the Swift Messenger. As a member of Bacon's Rosicrucian Brotherhood, Dr Wilkins was privy to many of the secrets of his life and writings. In the Mathematical Magic, 1648, in a chapter discussing subterraneous lamps, its author makes the following remarkable statement. Such a lamp is likewise related to be seen in the sepulchre of Francis Rosy Cross, as is more largely expressed in the confession of that fraternity. 
The passage contains a deliberate error, a device used by the Rosicrucian Brotherhood when disclosing a secret about Francis Bacon. The sepulchre with the lamp in its vault is described not in the Confessio Fraternitatis, but in the preceding first Rosicrucian manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis, with the passage cryptically indicating that Francis Bacon, Francis Rosy Cross, was the secret founder of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood and the author of its two manifestos. Four years later saw the publication of the English translation of the Fama and the Confessio, delivered under the pseudonym of Eugenius Philalethes, used by hermetic philosopher Thomas Vaughan. English translations of the two Rosicrucian manifestos had been circulating in manuscript for several decades. Thomas Vaughan, if it be him, states in the address that he was following a translation by an unknown hand, before further adding, the copy was communicated to me by a gentleman more learned than myself, and I should name him here, but that he expects not either thy thanks or mine. In his biography, Francis Bacon's Personal Life Story, the learned Freemason Alfred Dodd reproduces the title page of the 1652 edition of the Fame and Confession of the Fraternity of the Rose Cross with, and deciphers the secret message concealed within it. If a line be drawn from A in Fame to the corner of the left-hand page, i.e. from the top line to the bottom, the letters on the left side spell in cipher Frater Francis Bacon. The Baconian Rosicrucian Brotherhood were very active on many different fronts during the 1650s, with the publication of the Fame and Confession of the Rosy Cross and other Rosicrucian publications, much of it organised and directed at their secret meetings at Oxford and London, which eventually publicly emerged into the founding of the Rosicrucian Royal Society. By the beginning of the next decade, a very special work was in the process of being prepared, written, revised and published that is still little known to the world at large, and the full implications of it still not understood to the present day, entitled The Holy Guide, printed in the name of John Hayden, which is somewhat misleading as this collection of Rosicrucian writings commences with a special work written by the supreme head of the Rosicrucian fraternity, Lord Bacon. In the dedication to Sir Richard Temple, its author, in a style heavily reminiscent of Bacon, speaks of how ordinary men seek after fame and riches to seem great in the eyes of the world. Only the worthy who seek will find the place that has been unknown for a long time and which is hidden from the greatest part of the world. In echo in the Latin inscription around the emblem of Father Time on the title page of the New Atlantis, in time the hidden truth shall be revealed. He repeats from the scripture, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hidden that shall not be known. Being a servant of God and a secretary of nature, we do declare the will of God to the world, which he says, referring to other Rosicrucian publications, including their manifestos, we have already performed and published in Italy and England. Immediately following the dedication reproduced in this very rare and curious volume, by way of a preface is a close adaptation of Lord Bacon's New Atlantis, set forth under the auspices of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood. The difference simply being this, what is left latent in New Atlantis is made manifest in Land of the Rosicrucians. In the New Atlantis, where Bacon speaks of one of the wise men of the House of Solomon, this is changed to one of the wise men of the Society of the Rosicrucians. These type of changes occur throughout the text, confirming Bacon's New Atlantis and the land of the Rosicrucians are one and the same. The following is a representative example. Immediately following the reproduction of New Atlantis, Land of the Rosicrucians, is what appears to be a very curious and critically important fragment of autobiography from our Rosicrucian philosopher, John Hayden. But all is not what it seems. 
After some three pages, we are met with a strikingly anomalous passage, which begins with the line that, I was 20 when this book was finished, which should have struck an attentive reader as somewhat odd. John Hayden was born in 1629, and at the time of the publication of The Holy Guide, he was 33 years old. We have moreover just seen that the first work is the collection was in the collection was not written by Hayden, but is self evidently a version of Bacon's New Atlantis, maybe even the original version that he wrote when he was twenty, but could not be published in that form when alive to the world. What follows this opening statement is clearly not the words of a 33-year-old man, but one who is much older, near the end of his days and looking back over his life. The passage did not pass the keen-eyed attention of Constance M. Pott, who, at the time of writing, probably knew Bacon's works better than anyone else then alive. Few who have read much of Bacon will fail to recognise his sentiments, his intentions, nay, his very words. I was twenty when this book was finished, but methinks I have outlived myself and begin to be weary of the sun. I have shaken hands with delight and know all is vanity, and I think no man can live well once, but he that could live twice, yet for my own part I would not live over my hours past or begin again the minutes of my days, not because I have lived them well, but for fear I should live them worse. At my death I mean to take a total adieu of the world, not caring for the burden of a tombstone and epitaph, nor so much as the bare memory of my name to be found anywhere but in the universal register of God. For half a century, Bacon's close friend and Rosicrucian brother, Inigo Jones, had not been out of high Masonic office, serving as Grand Master and Deputy Grand Master of England. He died in 1652, and following the restoration of Charles II, he was succeeded as Grand Master of England in 1660 by Bacon's kinsman Henry Jermyn, Earl of St Alban, appointing Sir John Denham his Deputy Grand Master, who about the same time was elected one of the first Fellows of the Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic Royal Society. In his brilliant full-length biography, Henry Jermyn, Stuart's spymaster and architect of the British Empire, about whom very little was previously known, its author, Anthony Adolf, who suggests Bacon might have been his early mentor, states that Jermyn chose his title partly in memory of his kinsman and hero, Bacon, who he worshipped until his dying day. The Baconian Rosicrucian Royal Society, with its large number of Freemasons, was publicly formed by a group of 12 men on the 28th of November 1660. It included William Brunker, its first president, Dr John Wilkins, its first secretary, the great architect and future Grand Master of England, Christopher Wren, the celebrated chemist Robert Boyle and natural philosopher, and Baconian disciple Sir Kenelm Digby. From 1660, the home of the Royal Society was Gresham College, and following the fire of London, it took up temporary residence at Arundel House in 1665 for a period of eight years, the grand London townhouse previously owned by Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, at whose house at Highgate, Bacon was said to have died. In 1667, the official account of its obscure origins was published by Thomas Spratt as The History of the Royal Society, with a very important and revealing frontispiece. At its centre is a bust of King Charles II, with William Brunker, its first president, to his right, and on his left its true founder, Bacon, the supreme head of the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood. Its prime mover, Lord Bacon, is sitting under the prominent winged angel holding a trumpet, alluding to his first Rosicrucian manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis, which concludes with Under the Shadow of Jehovah's Wings. The first impression is the Masonic pavement in the forefront of the picture. It pushes towards the viewer so that it cannot be ignored. All Masons are told about the black and white chequered floor of the lodge room. 
The compasses and squares, of which there are four compasses and three squares in the plate, are described in Masonic ritual as follows. The compasses and square, when united, regulate, regulate our, lives, our lives and our actions. The compasses belong to the Grand Master in particular and the square to the whole craft. Finally, there is the positioning of the three figures. The seating of the officers of a lodge of Freemasons is very carefully controlled. Charles is placed as the Grand Master in the east, with the light of the rising sun behind him. Branca is placed in the seat of the senior working officer, while Bacon is placed in the seat of the immediate past master. Bacon is also shown in the frontispiece, wearing the jewel and collar of a chaplain of the Lodge of Edinburgh. Prefix to the volume is a long and important verse by Abraham Cowley, dedicated to the Royal Society, that in reality is penned in praise of Bacon, in which Cowley alludes to Bacon as the supreme poet and dramatist Shakespeare. With the deserts of poetry they fed him, and they chose his eye to entertain, his curious but not covetous eye, with painted scenes and pageants of the brain. Bacon at last a mighty man arose, whom a wise king and nature chose, Lord Chancellor of both their laws, and boldly undertook the injured pupil's cause. Bacon, like Moses, led us forth at last, the barren wilderness he passed, did on the very border stand of the blessed promised land, and from the mountain's top of his exalted wit saw it himself and showed us it. With the first official historian of the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Royal Society, leaving no room for doubt that its prime mover and great moving spirit was Lord Bacon, from whom it all originated. I shall only mention one great man who had the true imagination of the whole extent of this enterprise, as it is now set on foot, and that is the Lord Bacon in whose books there are everywhere scattered the best arguments that can be produced for the defence of experimental phil philosophy and the best directions that are needful to, to, to promote it. All which he has already adorned with so much art that if my desires could have prevailed with some excellent friends of mine who engaged me to this work, there should have been no other preface to the history of the Royal Society but some of his writings. The founder of the Francis Bacon Society, Constance M. Pott, the first to explore the question of when did Lord Bacon actually die and where he was buried, had a 12-year correspondence with Dr. Kirsch, a member of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. In their series of letters, Pott repeatedly stated her belief that Lord Bacon did not die in 1626. He only died to the world and lived to a great age. Following long research and collation of old works and their new revised and enlarged editions post-1626, which she believed were carried out by Bacon, she very strongly suspected that he lived to at least 1662 and perhaps even longer. Her correspondent, Dr. Kirsch, informed her that she had discovered the capital secret of Rosicrucianism. He then stated as an absolute matter of fact that Francis St. Alban lived to the age of 106. That is the age assigned to the Rosicrucian father. He died in 1668 in full possession of his faculties, having for 40 years after his supposed death continued to produce a mass of literature. It is believed that shortly after his feigned death, Bacon secretly slipped away to the continent, first to spend time in Paris and France, then likely travelling to The Hague in Holland, both centres of Rosicrucian activity, before eventually settling in Germany, where he lived for many years with the Andrea family, at whose head stood Johann Valentin Andrea. For several centuries, it was wrongly believed that he was the founder of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood and the concealed author of their first two manifestos, the Fama Fraternitatis and Confessio Fraternitatis, as well as the third Rosicrucian document, The Chemical Wedding. Nevertheless, he was certainly closely associated with the Rosicrucian Brotherhood and its movement.
In the first half of the last century, Bertram G. Theobald conducted a correspondence for some time with Herr Conrad Andrea of Frankfurt on Main, who was a direct descendant of Johann Valentin Andrea, from whom he received several photographs of pictures which had passed down numerous generations of the Andrea family. The first of these depicts Andrea at 42 years old, and a second portrait, published on the title page of the re-edition of the Christian Hercule, apparently depicts Andrea in old age. In her article, The Two Deaths of Francis Bacon, Mabel Sennett pointedly asks, are these two portraits of the same person? There is also a more well-known portrait, supposedly of Andrea, that is employed as the frontispiece to the Rosicrucian bibliography, adorned with some very curious symbols. On the top left-hand side of the portrait, as we look at it, is a winged helmet. In his essay of delay, Bacon observes, the helmet of Pluto, which maketh the politic man go invisible, is secrecy in the council and celerity in the execution. And in De Augmentis Scientiarum, Bacon links the helmet of Pluto, used to render men invisible, to the mirror of Pallas, representing foresight as to leave as little as possible to fortune. As part of the winged helmet in the portrait appears the two crosses of St Andrew, which are mirrored in the top right side by another cross of St Andrew, giving us three visible crosses concealing three invisible crosses, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. The St Andrew's cross is the same or mirrored in the St Albans cross, with its yellow satire and a blue field, originally used by the Abbey of St Albans, and is the corporate seal and heraldic album of St Albans. It is also found in the flags of St Albans Cathedral and the city of St Albans, Hertfordshire. According to the central legend of Freemasonry, the craft was introduced into England in the time of St Alban, a, fi a fictitious myth invented to conceal the true founder of the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, Francis Bacon, Viscount St Alban. He, Andrea, writes Freemason Dodd, was a mask for someone else who used the cross of St Andrew in one of the higher Masonic degrees as a Knight of St Andrew, adding that the cross shows the real origin of the continental Rosicrucian manifestos, St Albans, and the writer, Francis Bacon. Several Baconians, including the Freemason and Baconian biographer Alfred Dodd, were in contact with Frau von Lecoq, the wife of Professor von Lecoq of Berlin, in the first half of the last century. At the time, Frau von Lecoq was in regular contact with members of the Andrea family living in Frankfurt. Over a period of time, she struck up a friendship with Conrad Andrea, who possessed a unique library containing many surviving relics, artefacts and books relating to his ancestor, Johann Valentin Andrea, a key member of Bacon's secret Rosicrucian Brotherhood. She was granted access to some books on the genealogy of the Andrea family and came across a portrait surrounded by all the family arms. The following year, Frau von Lecoq submitted a request to the Andrea family to allow her to photograph all the family portraits which they granted. During this period, Frau von Lecoq exchanged many private letters with Dodd in which she told him, she was quite satisfied that she had discovered evidence in certain archives that Francis Bacon had lived in Germany after 1626 and had stayed for a long time in the Andrea family. She also sent him a photograph of the portrait referred to above. This is a remarkable photograph. It is said that Francis Bacon fled to the continent at Easter 1626 and that he did not die but went to live with the Andrea family. Frau von Lecoq was allowed to take this photograph by the permission of the Andrea descendants. Here we get Masonic and Rosicrucian emblems. It is in short a Masonic picture and the man in the centre is believed to be Francis Bacon as a very old man. The singular thing is that here we have two shields out of the many that surround the portrait, which simply contain the letters FB. 
Frau von Lecoq assured me that the Andrea possessors of the picture were quite uncertain that it was a picture of Andrea and could give no explanation of what the FB stood for apart from Francis Bacon, for whom Andrea was a field worker to propagate his secret order. The philosopher and father of the modern world, Francis Bacon, was born in secrecy, the eldest son of Queen Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, and was thus the unrecognised concealed heir to the throne of England. He was the secret author of the Shakespeare poems and plays, and spent most of his life secretly working for the future benefit of humanity with his inv invisible Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood. He was born in secrecy and died in secrecy. After his first death to the world, Bacon lived a second secret life which has not yet been revealed to the world by his invisible brotherhood, who closely guard and watch over the secrets of his first and second life, as well as his writings from both lives. As indicated on the title page of his New Atlantis, The Land of the Rosicrucians, the blueprint for the United States of America en route to their declared universal reformation of the whole world, in time the hidden truth will be revealed. His Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood will eventually disclose to the world where Bacon truly died and where he is actually buried and that he is the true author of the Shakespeare works as well as other secrets about his life and writings. The full truth will truly stagger humankind. <laughs>